Uh, Frank received his bachelor's from Queen's University in Canada and then went on uh, to get both a master's and a PhD at Harvard. Uh, after that, he went on a very short postdoctoral uh, research fellow position for a year at UCLA um, and then joined uh, the faculty at Princeton, where he stayed for four years before Vanderbilt stole him. Um, and he's been in Vanderbilt ever since. He is now a full professor there. Uh, Frank has received way too many awards to list all of them, uh, but some of the most impressive ones are Scientific American 50, which um, is an award that honors uh, 50 individuals, teams, companies, or organizations um, for accomplishments in, in research, business, and policy making. So it's, it's a pretty wide ranging award. He then went on to receive Young Investigator Award at both the Cognitive Neuroscience Society and the Vision Science Society, um, and finally the Trolland Research Award from the National Academy of Sciences. Um, Frank is well known for his uh, pioneering work on multi-voxel pattern analysis, um, going back uh, to the early days of that technique when he demonstrated how you can decode visual working memory uh, content from uh, the early visual cortex. Um, he has done a lot of really interesting work through the years on fMRI and decoding and visual perception, um, and is now moving on to a slightly different direction, uh, working with convolutional neural networks. And I think we're going to hear some about some of that recent work uh, right now. So Frank, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and take it away. Thanks very much, Dobby, for that very kind uh, introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, virtually. Uh, sorry we can't meet in person, uh, but I look forward to uh, meeting uh, many of you afterwards in, in individual meetings and, and uh, uh, hopefully it will be uh, a good replacement for actually um, meeting in person. Um, I'd like to begin my talk by discussing how each morning when we open our eyes, we're welcomed by a scientific feat that borders on uh, the miraculous. And that feat is the experience of vision. Because of vision, we can effortlessly parse key objects from their cluttered backgrounds. Because of vision, we have the opportunity to immerse ourselves in complex works of art, whether abstract or concrete. Yet, we often take for granted how we can so effortlessly process these huge amounts of information uh, because uh, we perception is so immediate. It seems like it's obvious that when you open your eyes, you should see and your brain should understand. To convey a sense of the, the computational challenges of vision, I've depicted an image here um, where it's rendered using numbers rather than pixel intensities. And so you can analyze it and study it. Wherever there are zeros and ones, it's darker. Where there are, there are like fives, sixes, and sevens, it's brighter. Can you figure out what this image depicts? Now I'm gonna replace this image with uh, actual uh, pixel intensities that have been discretized into just a couple discrete levels, I think from zero to up to nine. And, and here's the image. Um, you may have an impression, if it's hard to see, get a sense of what it is, if you squint your eyes, you may have a, an impression that you're seeing a face. You might even know whose face it is. You may even feel uh, rather fondly about this person, or perhaps not, depending on your persuasion. Uh, but in any case, you, you get the sense of how vision can, can process uh, this information and, and, you know, it's doing a huge amount of analysis that we, we take for granted. Um, before I go on with my, my, my main focus of my talk, uh, just because um, uh, this audience is a little bit more diverse and you might not know that much about me, I just want to give you a sense of the, the different research foci that my lab focuses on and uh, a sense of the different topics I could have covered. I, I struggle a little bit with what, what to choose to focus on in this talk and decided to talk about some of our, uh, in the last study I'll talk today about a recent transitions towards studying uh, convolutional neural networks. Uh, but a lot of uh, my research, which Navi alluded to, focuses on understanding the neural mechanisms of visual feature perception, such as orientation processing or motion processing. Um, we've even found evidence of coarse orientation selectivity in the human lateral genicleate nucleus. We also study visual attention and visual working memory using behavioral and uh, fMRI methods. Another branch of our lab's work is looking at figure ground processing and top-down feedback, uh, where to our surprise, we found that the LGN seems to be sensitive to perceptual figures. And you can also get a sense of uh, 
how a figure such as this might be represented based on the enhanced activity you could see, let's say in V1, back projecting into visual space. A new branch of work that we're venturing into actually is medical image perception. And though we don't have any publications on this, um, I'm very excited about this new area, uh, which uh, is, is uh, sort of exciting and challenging my thoughts about how, um, how to study vision and, and to emphasize uh, a more of a learning-based approach. And finally today, I'd like to talk to you about face and object processing. And I'm gonna take you through a tour of three studies from my lab, one from a, a bit further ago, one, one sort of intermediate and one, one more recent, uh, but they all are, are related to a common issue and, and they kind of show how you can think about a problem for a long time and kind of pick away at it and poke at it. And then maybe a few years later, you'll have another idea and, and they'll, they'll gradually sort of link up and, and hopefully it'll, it'll lead into an interesting direction. Uh, as you try to make headway on a on sort of a long-standing problem. So by way of background, uh, the organization of the human visual system uh, is, is extremely complex and sophisticated, yet we know more about the visual system than probably uh, most other systems of, of the brain. Uh, the human visual system consists of 30 plus visual areas. The primary visual cortex we know a lot about encodes color, orientation, motion, spatial frequency disparity. Uh, you have a sense of some of the, the features that might be learned by, by, by V1, uh, even though this is by a convolutional network, but the, the early layers of CNNs actually tend to learn uh, features that are, are useful for efficiently encoding uh, the information in natural images. And when you look at higher visual areas, they encode more complex properties, uh, such as curvature, texture, 3D properties, including aspects about objects that are learned. So, in addition, we know that vision isn't purely feed-forward, where signals go from uh, reach the retina, the LGN, V1, and propagate to higher regions of the ventral visual pathway and dorsal visual pathway. Uh, there are also uh, lots of lateral interactions that happen within each cortical area for computation and top-down feedback. So given the complexity of the human visual system, how might it ever be possible to understand it or model it? It turns out that convolutional neural networks uh, are an interesting uh, potential candidate model of, of the primate visual system. And, and the first CNNs were developed by uh, Krzyzewski, Hinton, and colleagues. Uh, and they've since had a huge amount of influence, not just in AI, but in neuroscience. Um, in terms of AI, uh, over the years, um, this sort of shows um, AlexNet, uh, the, the first CNN, and the performance of subsequent uh, CNN, such as GoogleNet or ResNet over here, um, it's been argued that, that their performance so accurately they've achieved or even surpassed human level performance at object recognition. Concurrently, neuroscientists have been looking at the representations learned by these deep neural networks and comparing them to the representations found in, either in the monkey visual system or the, the human visual system. And the correspondence is, is, is quite good. Um, it, it's been quite striking that these DNNs seem to learn visual representations that closely match those found in, in non-human and human primates. Now, does that mean case closed? You know, we, we've come up with a, a very good model of visual system and, and, and there's not that much more to be learned? Or, or is it really, you know, even though CNNs are quite good, sort of an overstatement or an exaggeration that, that they, they provide a good model of the visual system? How do we know um, which world we live in? How, how good are they doing? Um, when, when my lab started wanting to look at this issue, uh, you know, have DNNs, I'll use the term deep neural networks and CNNs, convolutional neural networks, interchangeably in this talk. Um, have they reached human level performance uh, in object recognition tasks? Um, our, our take was to see how a system works, test it at the very limits of its ability to perform. You really want to push it to its limits. Uh, so to convey that sense, I'm going to show you a, a very noisy object image. And some of you may be able to recognize it, some of you may not. This is sort of right near the threshold. And uh, you may have an impression you might not, uh, you might be able to guess the object uh, or not. And, and there's another one here, this one might be a little more difficult perhaps. Uh, but in both of them, they contain an object and I'll have it gradually unveiled. And I can also ask you how specific is your knowledge about the object? Even you have a sense of its general category. What do you know about it specifically? So I'll start to have the object emerge from the noise. That's the left object that's emerging. And you can see that it's a car. In fact, it's a convertible and it's an Audi TT. Uh, so you might have recognized this car. Could you tell it was a convertible or its, it's uh, model? Um, and on the right, what we have is an owl. Um, 
And so that gives you, gives you a sense of, of, of some of the challenges. Um, so here's an overview of the talk. Um, I'll describe sort of an fMRI study of how humans recognize objects in extreme levels of noise. Uh, I'll describe a study where we looked at object-based attention in cases of overlap and clutter and how feedback can modify visual responses. And I'll discuss a comparison of human and DNN performance at recognizing objects in severe noise at near threshold perceptibility. So regarding perceiving objects in noise, there's sort of uh, two views of, of how we recognize. Imagine you're sort of walking around, uh, you're taking a tour of, of the, the Africa and, and you're just walking along, not expecting anything. You know, you may want to, you know, sort of inspect your environment and, and look out for things that might be hiding in the grass, such as the lion over there. Um, so there's sort of two, a prevalent view of vision is that object segmentation is automatic and bottom up. And that attention acts on pre-segmented objects. It, the world is essentially parsed for us, and then we choose which objects we want to attend to after the fact. But an alternative view might be that top-down attention actually helps us segment and select objects in the presence of clutter and noise. And that without attention, um, you might fail to notice uh, the presence of this line. Of course, if you're look, talking about over attention, you look directly at it, it's easier to see. But you can notice that there's something there even when your, your eyes are, are away, although there will be some, some ambiguity. Um, so how might attention enhance visual processing in the presence of noise? Um, one idea is like you have, let's say you have this noisy image here and uh, you want to boost things. One, one idea is that you could just non-selectively amplify all the signals. Would that help? Uh, just to sort of visually depict it, I've shown this image now with higher amplitude, uh, but it still looks noisy. It's still not very easy to perceive. So this is an example of non-selective amplification. Another way you might want to deal with noise would be you have the original image that's noisy and you want to apply some sort of filtering process to try to clean up the noise a bit. Maybe it doesn't get rid of all the noise, but it, it makes it, um, it dampens it relative to the, the relevant signals that you want to, to perceive. And then after that, you might want to apply amplification and further enhance uh, the, the neural representation. This is sort of a cartoon-like view of possible processes that could happen in the brain, but it's a way to sort of depict um, how, how a system could potentially work. So we're gonna look into these ideas of amplification and uh, filtering. And here's, here's the, the, the original image upon which the, the noisy image was based. Um, and this is the perceptual template model by Lou and Dosher. And there's sort of different possible um, outcomes that could arise in perceptual performance if the visual system relied on something like amplification or noise filtering. So if attention serves to amplify signals in a, a non-selective manner, then if you present a stimulus without any noise on top of it, let's say a grading with no noise or whatever, you have to discriminate the orientation, then attention should boost performance. As you add more and more noise, performance will go down in extreme levels of noise and that noise will also impair the benefit of attention to some extent. So you get this sort of pattern of results. By contrast, if attention acts as sort of a, a, a noise filter and you put a bunch of noise, initially if you show the, the grading, um, whether it's attended or not, you shouldn't necessarily benefit from attention because um, it, attention only acts as a filter. It's not simply amplifying the signal. Um, also be clear that here the noise is external. We're not talking about internal noise. Um, so as you add more noise to the image, if attention acts as a sort of a noise filter, only under high noise conditions will you start to see a benefit of attention. And the final possible outcome could be that attention has both an amplification component and an external noise filtering component, in which case you'd see benefits throughout the, this range of where there's zero noise to higher levels of noise. Um, so that's a, a model based on sort of signal detection theory. And, but it's, it's an abstract model um, in the sense that, uh, how, how to describe it? It's, 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 it's not describing exactly what the nature of the noise filter is in the model. It's just sort of saying, let's say it can do it. Um, so to look at this question, we conducted uh, an fMRI study where we presented four categories of objects, faces, houses, or buildings, I should say, um, chairs and shoes, and they're presented either with no noise, I'll describe this as 1.0 uh, proportion signal, 
or signal to signal plus noise ratio. Uh, 0 .5 per, uh, 0 0.5 uh, proportion of signal, so half signal, half noise, or only 0 0.25. And you know, here it, it still seems pretty easy to see the objects, even though the noise level is moderate. But at this point, it really starts to feel like it's it's sort of near threshold, um, at least just sort of subjectively. And we're going to use fMRI to see how well we can decode the object category across these various conditions. And the stimuli will either be attended, where subjects are attending to the objects themselves, or they'll be attending to letters presented at central fixation and ignoring the objects. And it's a difficult attention task. Um, first off, let me just note that in terms of overall fMRI amplitude in the visual cortex, attention boosted everything uh, across all conditions. So whenever you attend to an object, you got a stronger response in visual cortex. But that sort of general boost across all conditions is not what you see when you look at the decoding results. That is, can you predict what category of object is being observed? So let's focus say on V1 over here. For noise-free objects, you don't see much of a benefit with attention here. And at moderate noise, these levels look fairly comparable. Um, but in the high noise case, 0 0.75, uh, you see quite a big boost of with attention. And then looking at these high level areas, VO, LO, parahippocampal place area, fusiform face area, what you see here is a different pattern of results. Uh, you know, this is the, the decoding accuracy uh, with no noise or moderate noise. And these curves look generally elevated when the objects are attended. And that's also true uh, in the high noise condition. So we took this to suggest that attention enhances the performance in early visual areas, but only in the presence of high external noise, uh, indicating some type of noise filtering operation. Now I can take those data and plot them in a somewhat different way, where we look at classification accuracy. Uh, here we're plotting it in terms of uh, D prime units. And this is the zero noise case, this is 0 0.5, and this is 0 0.75. And you can think back to sort of those theoretical figures I showed before um, with Lou and Dosher. So in V1, you can see that there's no separation here under zero noise, and the curves only start to separate with attention under high noise conditions. But as you move up the hierarchy, you start to see the sort of the, the curves running parallel, suggesting that both noise filtering and amplification are occurring. Um, we can fit a model to these data and calculate estimates of how much noise filtering is going on in each visual area from V1 up to the higher areas and how much amplification. And critically, it's only V1 as well as V2 that show noise filtering alone without amplification. So we take this, we interpret this to suggest that top-down feedback, when you attend to an object and it's in noise, what it does is it leads to noise filtering uh, in the early visual cortex in V1, V2. And presumably that noise filtered signal is then passed up uh, the visual pathway after that feedback operation occurs and subsequent amplification occurs um, thereafter. We further investigate this idea of how does top-down feedback help you select an object and uh, what role it might have in something like object-based attention. And there was an early um, highly influential study by O'Craven, Downing, and Canwisher where they had showed a face and a house overlapping to the participant. Participants were supposed to maintain fixation and one of the two objects would translate while the other was stationary. And they found that whenever you attended an object, uh, whichever object you're attending to, you not only modulated say the, the fusiform face area and parapacampal place area with object-based attention. If the object that you were attending to so happened to be moving, you saw greater activity in motion sense of area MT. And if you're attending to the station, object, you saw less activity. And so they, they described this as, as, as indicating object-based attention. Uh, but to me, the question is, well, well, how is it grabbing the object? And what do we mean when you're attending to an object and, mo and that's uh, modulating cortical activity? Is it enhancing faces per se that um, increases the response in the fusiform face area? Or is it that when I attend to face, I'm actually attending to local features that belong to the face? For example, this eye, uh, creates this horizontal sort of streak, let's say in V1 or, or this mouth. Um, are those the features that are being boosted 
with feedback going all the way back to earlier stages of visual processing. So the questions we want to ask are whether, and this work done with Elias Cohen, uh, does object-based selection rely on feedback to early visual areas? Um, if so, some predictions we have is that early visual activity should be biased in favor of the attended object. Bias signals, these bias signals in early visual areas should be predictive of intentional bias in higher areas. And successful bias should depend on high-level object knowledge. Um, to convey the, the nature of the task, uh, we had blocks where we'd show single faces um, and participants had to perform a uh, same different task and trials where it was a face house overlapping and a central cue would indicate whether they should attend to face or house. So to convey the task, um, just note whether you notice that it's the same stimulus or different stimulus. So here it's a single face. You probably noticed that that was the same. Now we'll do a single house. Probably notice that was different. Now you need to attend face. Imagine the red cue means to attend face. That probably felt a little more difficult. Uh, our subjects were very accurate this task. I think about 95% accurate for the attention task. Uh, that was a different trial. Now you want to attend house. And this is sort of a, a nitpicky note, but the color cue, its meaning changed halfway in the experiment so that the actual color is not predictive of the object being attended. So it's attend house. And that was a, a same trial. That might have actually been the doorway of my house. I'd have to double check our old house. Uh, we went around the, the, the lab went around uh, Nashville and took pictures of people's porches. So we call it the, the faces versus porches sort of stimuli set. Um, okay, so now what we can do is, since in the attention case, you're always seeing a face house overlapping, the question mark is whether you can decode what is being attended from the activity patterns to the single uh, single stimuli, for instance. Um, well, that will be one of the analyses that we will do. And these are the results. So we can decode, use the activity patterns for single objects to decode what object uh, was being viewed on separate runs, fMRI runs, with very high accuracy. It's, it's almost 100%. Um, likewise, we can decode uh, which of the two objects is being attended um, and with quite high accuracy. It does tend to increase as you go up the visual hierarchy, but it's already quite good in primary visual cortex, around 80%. And then we can train um, a pattern classifier, linear classifier, such as using SVM, say, uh, on the activity patterns for single objects and try to predict what's being attended here. And, you know, if, if the attention pattern evoked by attention bears, you know, little resemblance to the, the single object, then, then this generalization will be bad. But if it's it's very similar, then it should be good. And in fact, this is the generalization performance. So to us, what this means is that when you attend to a face or a house, you're essentially biasing the activity pattern that would be created by a, a, a blended stimulus. So the activity is shifted in the direction of what it would be if only a single object were shown alone. You know, highly consistent with sort of the, what people call the bias competition theory of attention. Now, the next question is whether we can show that there's a functional coupling of signals across different brain areas. And to do this, we can look at individual fMRI blocks. So in an fMRI block, you would have four trials in a row of doing the attention task. Uh, and we can train a, a pattern classifier first on the single object case discriminating between face versus house. And then we use that classifier and say, on a given trial, how much was activity biased in a particular direction? So let's say this was a attend house trial we can measure its distance from the hyperplane, and uh, the, the further the distance, more it's biased in favor of um, house. If it, this data point happened to fall on the wrong side of a classifier, it would be a negative number. Here would be a, a positive number. Now we can ask, if we look at the bias signals in high-level areas, fusiform face area and parapocampal place area, which respond preferentially to faces for, or houses, um, you know, what's the relationship to the bias signals we find in V1 versus V4? Even though V1 and V4 are like very different things than the FFA PPA, perhaps we can use this technique to compare apples and oranges. And indeed, we did find that the bias signals in fusiform face area 
and pair pancake replacer are strongly predicted by the bias strength in V1 to V4. Um, if, it, if it were not uh, correlated across areas, you know, these could be separated for faces and houses, but they'd be circles rather than these elongated ellipses. And so the correlations were quite high for this representative subject. Um, and we can look across all six subjects. And the, this effect was, was very whopping. It was actually kind of funny. We had a reviewer who say, how do you know this effect is statistically significant? And it was something like less than P.01 or P.001 for, for every subject, uh, six subjects, 12 conditions. And we, we said, you know, the, the odds of observing this is something like 10 to the negative. I forget, it was like 20 something or, or whatever. And so uh, we, we feel confident that it's, it's probably, probably significant. Uh, anyway, so we found evidence of strong functional coupling of object-specific attentional bias across low and high-level visual areas uh, in this study. Um, so some conclusions regarding object-based attention. Uh, object-based attention involves selective feedback that modulates responses at the earliest stage of cortical processing. Such modulation leads to strong functional coupling across visual areas. Uh, Top-down modulation is also based on high-level object knowledge. Uh, one study that I have time to take you through is that we would present these faces and houses either upright or upside down. And when they're shown upside down, you know, V1 doesn't in some sense know what a face is, but when you show the faces upside down and they're briefly flashed, um, we no longer observed a, um, a, a reliable effect of object-based attention in, in V1. So there's something about knowing the configuration of a face and, and having a particular expectation that leads to these, these, the coherence of attentional selection. Uh, when these top-down signals go back. Uh, and we also found in, in the earlier study that object-based attention can lead to denoising of visual signals to enhance the robustness of the visual system. So the final study I'd like to describe to you is, is a recent one. Um, it, after a long and circuitous route, uh, it'll be uh, coming up soon, hopefully, in, in PLOS biology. And the study's title is called Noise Trained Deep Neural Networks Effectively Predict Human Vision and Its Neural Responses to Challenging Images. Um, our nickname for the study was the humans versus the machines. Uh, that was our, our nickname for the study uh, when, we, when, we, when we came up with the ideas to do it. And as described earlier, I'm going to describe how noisy a stimulus is in terms of its signal to signal plus noise ratio. Uh, or you can all think of, so think of it as what proportion of this image overall uh, is composed of signal. Um, and this is just a, a simple formula that, that describes that here. Um, these are the experimental stimuli we used, and, and I should really call out and highlight the, the first author of the study, Ho Jin Jang. Uh, he's, he's a grad student in my lab uh, when he did this work. Um, he, he's recently moved on, and he's, he's doing a, a postdoc with me for a bit, um, and he's just um, stellar in terms of um, uh, working with the convolutional networks, doing very, very complex analyses and um, gathering these data. <clears throat> Um, the objects were presented with varying SSNR levels from 0 0.05 up to 1 for the CNNs and uh, more sort of uh, selective SSNR levels for the, the humans, uh, just to reduce the number of conditions. Uh, to convey with you, uh, to you a little bit of, of what the stimuli look like and, and the task and, and what an SSNR level looks like, um, here's an object being shown at 0 0.05 SSNR. Uh, if you can recognize what it is, I will give you lots of money because I want to then test your brain. Um, but I don't think anyone can see anything at this noise level. Um, this is 0 0.1. Uh, in my view, this is still beyond uh, detectability, maybe for humans or machines. Um, again, if you think you know what it is, you know, let me know or, or write it on the back of an envelope or something like that. Um, 0 0.15, you may have some vague semblance, but maybe not much. Um, 0 0.2, at this point, some people can start to see something, other people not. I've also noticed a lot of individual differences in terms of ability. Let's keep going up. 0 0.25, some people might see something. Also, people tend to see something more on the left than the right, usually. Um, this is 0 0.3. At this point, I think hopefully many of you can see it. And I'm going to go up to 0 0.4. And I think at this point, everyone sees that it's a Jeep, and it's the same image on both sides. Uh, and if I go back down, just so you have a sense of an impression, you can try to hold on to the object. And if you feel like you can see it now at a noise level that you couldn't before, that's an example of perceptual hysteresis where your visual memory interacts with um, your perceptions. We're going to test uh, humans and we're going to test a bunch of convolutional networks, um, those listed here. 
And uh, so we gathered these data and, and looked at the performance. And this, this is what we saw. Um, you can see the, this is the average performance of many deep neural networks shown here on the right uh, from AlexNet going to a much deeper network, ResNet 152. Uh, and first off, you can see that humans are just doing much, much better than the deep neural networks. There's another also interesting aspect is that the humans do better on the objects in Gaussian pixelated noise. And they find that the objects in Fourier phase scrambled noise to be more difficult, as indicated by this, this curve is, appears to be shifted to the right. Whereas for the deep neural networks, they do better for objects in Fourier noise than pixelated noise. So their pattern of performance is qualitatively different than humans. That means that they're processing visual information in a qualitatively different manner. Um, there, if you had a test for are you human, you could show these two different objects, you know, like, you know, the I'm a robot, those those kinds of things are the CAPTCHAs. You could you could use this as a as a CAPTCHA for, you know, you're, you're not human. Uh, another thing just to highlight just how much better the humans are doing at this noise level of 0 0.5 SSNR. Humans are, you know, they're, they're down a little bit, but they're, they're still pretty close to ceiling. Whereas the deep neural networks are dropping to, you know, around 50% accuracy. If we go to, uh, and this is sort of what the images would look like at that noise level. If we go to an even noisier level, as illustrated here, performance are getting it right, uh, humans are getting it right about half the time, whereas the CNNs are down near floor. Um, so th this is a really, really huge difference in, uh, in, in performance. If you look at the confusion matrices, you can see that when the noise level gets high, uh, the SSNR level gets low, the CNNs start to make errors and, and are biased towards certain categories, not just a single category necessarily, but certain categories. Whereas the humans do quite well, uh, they might show a little bias, but they, they do quite well in general uh, across a range of noise levels. And this is for Fourier phase scrambled noise. And the, the bias, um, two of the categories are the same as before, the third one is different than, than the one you saw with pixelated noise. So that was great. Um, we, we discussed those results and, and my, 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 my grad student came and said, this is, this is cool. And I said, that's great. Uh, humans one, machines zero. But then I asked Hojin, do you think we could make the DNNs better? And we thought about it. Um, and I suggest that we could train the DNNs uh, on noisy object images and see how they do. And at first we just trained them only with noise and it didn't work out great. Um, uh, partly because uh, the networks then become specialized and, and, and they get very bad at recognizing clear images. Uh, but then we used a mixture of um, clear and noisy images and, and it did better, uh, which I'll show soon. Um, well, I should, in full disclosure, I should mention that the noise training methods described in the study are described in a patent issued uh, with the US um, Patent and Trademark Office. Um, so just full disclosure. Uh, so this is what we saw when we trained uh, DNNs with, uh, this is VGG19 with a mixture of, um, this is just clear images only, say clear images and uh, images with 0 0.7 SSNR, uh, or as they get noisier here, moving to the right, you can see that as the images get noisier, we see more robust performance to, to more extreme noise levels. This curve shifts leftward for the, for the noise trained DNN. These are the colored curves shown in say green or blue. And this was also true for Fourier phase scramble noise. I'm not going to show a plot of this, but the benefit of noise training was noise specific. So if you train on one type of noise, you're not good at the other type of noise and vice versa. But we did find that you could train a single network to be robust to both. And the results that I'll present you next are primarily using uh, a version of VG19 that was trained to be robust to both types of noise. The other thing I should emphasize, um, I mean, this is I think just basic hygiene in terms of running studies with CNNs is that the noisy object images that you use for training are different from the ones used at test. So it's, those are all novel images. It, it's seen the noise before, but it's never seen the, the actual object image before when it's tested. And so when we tested these noise train networks with the noisy object images, um, this is what a network that was trained on um, 0 0.2 to, to 1.0 uh, noise range. We saw um, much better performance. Uh, also, you'll notice that the performance in terms of Gaussian versus Fourier is qualitatively more similar 
to humans now, where it does better now with Gaussian noise than Fourier noise. We can isolate uh, a SSNR threshold, the point at which accuracy reaches 50% um, correct uh, in this one in 16 categorization task and capture like, so, so here, this SSNR here would be somewhere below 0.2, like maybe, I don't know, 1.5 or something like that. Um, and we can plot that. And here is the noise trained BGG19. Here is each of the 20 human observers that we tested shown in gray. And here are the, the eight original deep neural networks that we tested without noise training. So you can see that the, the benefit is quite huge. It's not just outperforming the, the DNNs, it outperformed every human uh, that we tested in this task. So noise trained DNNs can outperform humans at recognizing noisy objects. Moreover, the performance is qualitatively more similar. We wanted to test this uh, to a further extreme, so, so I'll, I'll describe a follow-up experiment soon. Um, but one thing we wanted to do was, how does this noise training alter the representations of the hierarchical DNNs? And we devised a, a layer-specific noise sensitivity analysis. Uh, the way we did this is that we could look at the activity patterns in each layer of the DNN for noise-free image, and then see how similar or different it is to that same image shown at varying levels of noise. If the network is robust to noise, and even at high noise levels, this correlation should still remain quite good, or the active pattern should remain stable as you add noise to the image. So we can look at how correlation changes as the SSNR level um, goes from one to coming on down, and ask at what point does the correlation between these activity patterns evoked by these stimuli fall to 0 0.5. And we do this analysis, what we found is that for the standard DNN, the uh, SSNR threshold actually tends to increase cross layers. Whereas the noise trained DNN, the SSNR threshold actually decreased across layers progressively. For Fourier, the pattern was, was similar, but also with some differences. Here you can notice that the SSNR threshold stays, you know, fairly stable um, across layers. It doesn't go down, uh, but it does go up considerably for the standard DNN. What we take this to mean is that in the standard DNNs, you know, both of these, these slopes are upward, they're positive, um, the contaminating effect of noise tends to become amplified across successive stages of processing. By contrast, for noise-trained CNNs, uh, successive stages of processing can lead to stable responses or even denoise responses in the case of Gaussian noise. Across excessive layers, you know, the, the representation becomes more and more robust as you go along. And that makes sense because Gaussian pixelated noise is spatially independent. So if you pool the information with larger receptive fields in a way that you know, doesn't exacerbate the presence, isn't exacerbated by the presence of noise, you should be able to have gains there because um, the noise will average out and the relevant signal will be sustained. Whereas with Fourier phase scramble noise, that's spatially structured and, you know, maybe you can't expect to, to do that much better in the presence of that type of structured noise um, across the six of stages. We also performed a layer-specific SVM decoding analysis where we trained a linear classifier on activity patterns to noise-free images, and then we tried to classify um, the object uh, for noisy images, and we can identify a, a SSNR classification threshold. Um, now, the accuracy of classification is not very good in the early layers uh, because the representations aren't very developed. Uh, so that's not surprising. But what's more interesting is where the noise trained DNN tested in this manner and the standard DNN tend to diverge. And in both cases, it diverges earlier for Gaussian noise and Fourier noise. Uh, but in both cases, the divergence tends to happen uh, in intermediate and higher layers. And to us, that tells us that uh, noise training is, is changing the representations throughout the whole network. Um, it's not necessarily being solved at a very, very early stage of processing. And, uh, and that robustness to noise um, probably involves um, uh, learning at, at multiple levels of, of the visual system. So we wanted to conduct a follow-up behavioral study to look at just how much better aligned the, the representations might be for the noise-trained CNNs as compared to standard CNNs. Um, and our task works as follows. So the participant would come in, they'd be shown a series of images on a single trial that would gradually uh, become less noisy. 
uh, along with it, we actually had a little sound that went with it. It'd go kind of like this, boop, 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 boop. So they have a kind of sense of where they are along in the trial. And once uh, the participant is confident that they think they know what object is, they're supposed to hit a key and that stops the animation. And then they're asked to classify what object it is. Uh, the screen is blank at that moment. And then afterwards, uh, they, I'll, I'll describe the painting in a sec. But the, the way we incentivize participants here is that subjects can earn more money for faster responses, but only if they're correct. If they're wrong, they, they don't get any points on that trial. And if they wait to the end and just respond, they, they get like 0 0.05 of a point rather than a whole point. So they're, they're very incentivized to try to be faster. Our three behavioral measures are as follows, accuracy, uh, the SSNR threshold estimate, which is a subjective one, uh, subjects choose their, their criterion for when they hit the button, but we still get an estimate. And then afterwards, they do a painting task to report what portion of the image they found was most informative for their judgment. So after they make their classification judgment, they're then shown the image and they're asked to paint, you know, what portion of the image led you to make your, your judgment? And this is the thresholds, the SSNR thresholds that we observed for, for humans and in comparison to the DNNs. And so for standard DNNs, the correlation between thresholds is, is there is a significant positive correlation, but it's, it's, it's quite low, 0.24. And for the noise stream DNN, it's, it's considerably better, 0.53. Now, human to human correlations are much higher still. So there's still a lot of room to grow, but certainly these noise stream DNNs are performing this task in a more human-like manner than, than standard ones. We can also look at the, uh, we can call them saliency maps um, of humans and DNNs. So these are the portions of, of humans who, who answered, say, correctly to this image and the, the, the heat map that results. And you can see that this is the, the saliency map used, uh, identified using, I'm not gonna go into the details, layer-wise relevance propagation, but you can basically see what features in the first layer are being most utilized for the judgments um, by the CNN for its classification decision. And this is for the, the noise train CNN here. Um, here's, here's an example, uh, sports car, uh, humans with correct answers, humans with wrong answers, and the pre-trained and noise train CNN. So we can look at all these images and say, what's the spatial correlation of the labeled regions? And the noise train CNN outperforms um, the standard CNN again, across higher noise levels, as you can see here. Um, I should point out that the human to human correspondence is higher still, so there's still room for improvement, but we think that this, this gets us you know, part of the way there. Finally, we wanna ask whether um, responses in the human visual system itself uh, to noisy objects might be more aligned um, for these noise trained DNNs. And as a first pass, we, we showed um, 16 different object images and we showed them uh, multiple times in the fMRI scanner. Uh, they were drawn from eight of the categories rather than all 16, four animate and four inanimate categories and two images within each category. And then we just looked at how accurately we could classify the specific image that was being seen based on the activity patterns observed in a given visual area. So just V1, V4, fusiform face area, LOC. Um, as before, just because these high-level areas, the, the, the signals tend to be a little bit more, I'm gonna use a non-scientific word, mushy. Classification and accuracy is good, but you know a little bit worse than the early areas. Um, but regardless, in all cases, we tend to see best performance for, for clean images. Then the next second best was, was for Gaussian noise, as we might expect, and it was worse for Fourier noise. So this difference between Gaussian and Fourier, even though the noise levels were comparable, uh, in terms of their contrast uh, implies that the, the human visual system finds it harder to discriminate objects in Fourier noise as compared to Gaussian noise. Now we can also look at the um, patterns of activity and their similarities to one another. So imagine we have two different images of a bear, or let's say a bear and a bison, even though they're different categories are pointed in the same way and have, have a more similar shape you'd expect those objects to evoke more similar activity patterns in the visual cortex, even when they're in noise, um, if, if uh, the visual system is able to register that information in an appropriate way. And then we can look at the similarity of the activity patterns across the different object categories for the, 
for the standard and noise trained CNNs. And this is showing the data across the 19 layers of VGG19 and the similarity between the activity patterns in those layers of the VGG19 to, let's say, uh, the discriminability of activity patterns in human V1. And this swath of blue that you see means that the noise trained DNN does better in all these layers uh, in terms of the ability to fit the data in human V1. And the performance uh, is quite good in, in the, once you get past the first few early layers where the receptive fields are very small uh, for the CNN. And it remains high all the way up until close to the classification layers where it suddenly drops down. Um, and that's true for all these early visual areas. In the object areas, you see that performance is good throughout and it remains high even in the final um, classification layers. Uh, I shouldn't say classification, I should say fully connected layers. Um, so the main finding here is that noise tree and DNNs do provide a better prediction of how the visual system will respond to uh, objects in visual noise and provides a better account of the, the neural data that we're observing. So if noise trained DNNs are more robust to noise, like this artificial noise, um, would this transfer to cases of real world noise? And one reason we wanted to test it is that, you know, how is it that humans are robust to noise uh, when they haven't seen necessarily these noise types? Um, I mean, some of you, you know, all of you probably still watch TV, but most of you probably don't watch TV with a, an antenna anymore and see um, objects and noise. I, I went through a fair bit of that in my childhood because uh, I'm older. Uh, so, so maybe that's why I'm robust to noise. But there, there are other situations, although it's not exactly like the artificial noise here, if you think about fog or snow or rain and how it obscures your vision, um, or you could be driving by and maybe there's a there's a, a, a smoke from a fire and the ashes are, 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 are wafting up, or you're looking through a dirty window pane and there's specks of dirt on there. All those add to a type of noise to the image uh, and create certain statistical relationships that may bear a little bit resemblance to the artificial noise. Um, so we wanted to ask, uh, it's hard to capture all those statistical properties, by the way, it's non-trivial to describe them mathematically. Um, but we wanted to ask whether CNNs trained on artificial noise might do better at recognizing objects in real world noise. And we decided to focus on vehicles uh, and we picked these eight vehicle categories. Um, we did a Google image-based search for vehicles in noisy weather using four search terms, rain, snow, fog, uh, storm, um, and I guess you could say dust storm is, is a fifth one, uh, depending on how you look at it. Um, and then sorted through over 10,000 images and had independent raters uh, identify 100 plus candidate images and rate their noisiness. And so we presented these images to uh, VGG19, which was trained on all thousand categories of image net with both types of noise. And what we observed was that the for noise-free images, performance was similar uh, in terms of accuracy. Uh, but for the noisy images, accuracy was better. This is top one accuracy, this is top five accuracy. And if we divide it into weak, medium, or strong levels noise, as rated by human observers, um, we tend to see uh, significant effects in the medium and strong cases. So we can conclude that noise trained VG19 performs significantly better at recognizing vehicles in real world noise. I should also add or comment that for humans, the accuracy would be much better still here. So whereas uh, these noise trained CNNs can outperform humans on our types of noise, humans would still do better on these sort of um, real world noise conditions. Um, but still, the, the improvement, I think, is, 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 is exciting and, and, and promising or encouraging. So to conclude, uh, noise trained DNNs provide a better model of human behavioral and neural responses to objects and noise. Noise trained DNNs can predict both qualitative aspects, Gaussian versus Fourier noise, and quantitative aspects of human performance, even at the level of individual object images. The robustness of the human visual system is typically considered as a design and engineering problem, but perhaps it's more of a learning problem. I'm happy to talk more about that during the discussion. Acquisition of robustness to noise involves modified representations at multiple levels of the visual system, including intermediate and higher levels. Now I should note, and you'll notice sort of a subtle disconnect between the first two studies in my talk and this one, uh, because we haven't incorporated attention yet. Um, the DNNs tested so far lack top-down feedback and lateral interactions, which presumably help confer greater robustness in biological visual systems. And that's something that I hope uh, to, to try to study more in the future. And, and I think um, an interesting questions will, will evolve from there. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'd like to acknowledge uh, my sources of funding 
and to the current members of the lab and to former members of the lab, uh, many of whom also contributed to the work that was presented here. Thanks. Frank, time of applause from everybody in the audience. Thanks, Abby. All right, so uh, if you have questions, please either type them in the chat or unmute and ask them. Uh, we already have one question from slightly early in the talk, and Dolly was asking um, if you have any data on what humans encounter more frequently in real life, Gaussian or Fourier face scrambled. But I think Frank already answered that, so. <laughs> yeah, I would anticipated say, I mean, that. So, so, so snow isn't, so snow would tend to make things brighter and, and can be partially transparent. So it'd be a little bit closer to pixelated noise, uh, Gaussian noise. Um, but Fourier phase scramble noise could also be like fog, uh, which has a, a bit of structure to it, but not very much structure. Um, so people have asked whether occlusion can produce something that's kind of like noise. So our noise was what's called additive noise. It's added to the original signal. Um, and so I don't know if occlusion would count or not because it's sort of replacing pixels. But if you think about time, if something is occluding and over time and you average over time, then even an occluder, like seeing an object through leaves can create something that's a little bit like uh, additive noise averaged over time. Um, it's it's kind of complex. Um, and actually obtaining real world, we thought about obtaining real world statistics on it, but it's it's kind of non-trivial. I once had the idea of turning on a garden hose and taking a picture of stuff and having the hose on versus not, um, but I haven't done that study yet. Um, probably could never get it published, but yeah, uh, that's sort of the idea. Yeah. Thank you. All right, Andrew is asking this, does this apply to the type of noise where physical objects are obscuring the image? Things yeah, so I think we, we touched on it. I think occlusion is, is, a, is a somewhat different problem than atmospheric noise that, that you might see, what we associate with weather, for instance. Um, there, there might be some relationship, I, I, but I think those two are, are, are somewhat different. Um, and yeah, occlusion is, is, is another, you know, uh, I don't want to say whole other beast, but 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 perhaps different. Yeah. I have a question. Oh. Go ahead, Hannah. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'll um I'll also go. Oh, yeah. Really awesome talk. Um. So I was. I really like your like earlier result when you are showing the difference between like early visual areas uh, versus later like higher up visual areas when you like, like different effect of like no, um, noise filtering versus um, amplification, um, and that is actually when the the task is to classify objects, right? Um, would you get the similar effects in early visual areas as in the later visual areas if you use simpler stimuli, for example, like? Like drifting gratings, or um, like just the like classifying, like um, I don't know, Gabor filter, like the orientation of Gabor filters. Um. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think if we use simpler stimuli, I would expect that the that the similarity that noise train CNNs would do better than standard CNNs, um, and that would be true for the early visual areas. You don't get great decoding of those low level features in the high level areas. So I'm not sure we'd see much of a benefit there. Um, but yeah, I think I think that, I mean, we do see, you know, when you get past the first couple layers, we do see better performance for noise train CNNs than standard CNNs um, in their ability to re represent information. And the, the, the learned features at those stages are not super complex. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that it would be, uh, we'd see those differences. Another thing that you'll notice it, or, is that we didn't exactly explain how the networks become more noise robust. So they're doing better and we can quantify that. We can quantify that in great detail and analyze that, uh, but it's actually a little bit hard to describe exactly what's better about them. Um, and, and, you know, we, we could probably send this problem to, uh, you know, some people who are very sophisticated at math, but it's still 
a little bit non-trivial to describe it as sort of a back of the envelope explanation, I think. Um, because these networks are they're 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 deep and and so which I think is interesting that we can study something computationally. We we have all the tools to if you want to, you could study the, the networks all day uh, and work with them. You can work with one unit or you could try to do analysis of many, uh, but, and, and they are different. They're, they're pretty quantifiably different, uh, but it's hard to pinpoint the exact computations that cause these differences. I think the, the best way to describe it is that when you train a standard CNN on a set of images, whether it's ImageNet or whatever, and they're all generally clean, uh, it lacks the full statistics of the natural world to lead to robustness. Um, that would be the, the closest I have. Um, now, whether we could have a human have just live an image net like experience and see how good or bad they are, I, I don't think we have the ethics to do it, but that would be a, a control experiment, uh, I guess. Um, it has also led me, just as a side thought, to wonder a little bit about studies in monkeys and mice. So like if you're in a cage environment and all you see is, you know, the cage environment and it's not very visually rich, you know, how much might that affect the the um the the system compared to one where like uh like my dad my dog gets to go for walks and forages for stuff in the grass and stuff like that and and has to see stuff under more challenging conditions, you know. Um, Frank, I have a question. I have yep. a question actually related to, you know, kind of related to what you were talking about with noise and, you know, why humans are ro so robust to noise. I was curious whether or not you think that just with the development of the visual system, like, you know, babies can't focus very well when they're born and like kind of that training um, does something to, um, I don't, you know, I don't know if a defocused image is considered a noisy image, but I, I just was curious about your thoughts on whether, um, something like a defocused image would help with, uh, you know, the accuracy in, in high noise conditions? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so we have a sort of a side issue, but we have a, a recent paper that looks at um, training convolutional, it just came out in Journal of Vision, uh, training convolutional networks on a sequence of blurry to clear uh, images to sort of try to mimic the developmental sequence of, of vision gradually going from blurry to clear. Um, and the point of that paper was more to sh show that, what we found is that you get robustness to blur uh, for faces in a network that's trained from blurry to clear uh, images. But if you take a convolutional network and you train it on blurry to clear objects, uh, it gradually loses the ability to recognize blurry objects and gets pushed towards just recognizing uh, clear objects. And so, we argue that this actually is sort of a computational evidence that face processing and object processing uh, are quite distinct and faces can be processed more holistically than objects. Um, somewhat separate from that and not in that paper, but in a paper that we're working on now, uh, we do find some benefit, not a huge benefit, but a, a modest, significant but modest benefit uh, with blur training on recognizing objects in noise. So it does help it learn somewhat better representations. Again, this goes back to the fact that ImageNet, all the images are, are clear and might not fully challenge the system. Um, the, uh, the blurry images seem to help the CNNs uh, somewhat so that they're, they're a little more robust. Um, and so that's a paper that, that, that we're in the midst of, of working on now. So that's an excellent question, but we haven't found sort of the, like uh, a magic, bullet that exactly makes a CNN human like because because we, we ask you know like uh, you know the noise levels that we're training these CNNs on are, are, are quite strong and might not exactly match you know what we experience in the real world um, so we're still trying to figure out how to think about that or go about it or maybe get training stimuli that are more appropriate like naturalistic yeah yeah those are cool thank you questions. yeah Prashant, did you have a quick question? Uh, I have a question. Uh, if we have time, I'm going to go. I think we can go a few more minutes, yeah. 
Okay, so my question is, uh, uh, among the models that you were trying, I saw that uh, you actually selected VGG19 as the most uh, similar one to what human show in their performance. Is there something specific about VGG19? Have you, like, what is uh, essentially different in their structure uh, with other models you tried? Uh, I, before showing the results, I would uh, actually, um, say that maybe ResNet would show uh, the most uh, similar performance because of uh, its connections and feed forward uh, layers. Um, but yeah, I mean, the question is, what is it specific about VDG19? Yeah, we we also work with ResNet. Um, there, there's, if you, when the paper comes out, there's a supplement and we present some of the data from ResNet and ResNet can actually achieve uh, after noise training and accuracy that's somewhat better than VGD19. Um, the, I'd have to think back about the fitting of the data to uh, the human behavioral data or fMRI data. Um, we don't report that, uh, but I think the results are not that different. The, one of the things is, um, is just we, the, the, the paper, I, I've just presented you some of it, but like the paper had a lot of experiments and a lot of analyses and uh, VGD19 was just sort of a convenient network to work with because it was faster to train and work with. So, and it already performed, you know, quite well, um, you know, right from the beginning. Uh, whereas AlexNet um, is okay, but but didn't do so well. So it was really just a point of convenience, just because it takes um, a lot of time to, to to train these networks, especially when you start doing the thousand category stuff. Um, take take takes it just takes computational time. Um, we have some GPU workstations that are a little faster now, so it wouldn't be uh, quite as long. But, you know, this study goes back, we started this work maybe even four or five years ago, and so it's just sort of been extensive. And, and uh, yeah, I, I think one can look at more nuanced ways. ResNet is, is actually very deep. It might be a little too deep, you know what I mean? Because it's probably deeper than our visual system. Um, so it can learn to solve things that, that don't quite make sense. One one thing that somebody pointed out I thought was interesting is like you could take ResNet and you can shuffle um, the images in ImageNet so that they form arbitrary categories and it can learn those mappings too, kind of thing, you know, it's um, which is kind of weird when you think about it, yeah. Um, well, it's been great talking with you. I should get ready for the next meeting, which is with the students and uh, and I'll look forward to to talking with you there. Some applause Thanks, from Great. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.